if Jesus returned today. Would he find us walking toward him? Or away from him? Would he find us selfless? Or self-centered? Would he find us loving people? Or loving ourselves? Would he find us faithful? Or faithless? Would he find us giving? Or taking? Would he find us working the harvest? Or ignoring the field? Would he find us humble? Or arrogant? Would he find us worshipping him? Or bowing to idols? Would he find us reaching for the light? Or stumbling through the darkness? The question is not when Jesus will return. It is, what will we do before he gets here? What if someone used the events, the events of our days, the events of the time, to prove to you that the day of the Lord has already come? The implication would be that you just missed out on it. And you just missed out on the blessings you expected from the Lord. That kind of reminds me of an example of Prediction addiction. I remember in the year 2000, as we were celebrating New Year's Eve, it was an important day for many of us, right? The change of a millennium in the year 2000. And uh, in our family, we had a tradition to watch the ball come down from New York City. So we turned on the TV and as we were flipping to get to that, we saw this preacher shouting, very emphatic, stating that all the real people of God would have been raptured by then. And you who see this video, you who see this recording, are left behind. And you know what? I remember thinking how he must have felt when he watched himself on TV saying those things. The implication, again, it w would be that you just missed out on, on that. Church members in Thessalonica were confused by messages like that. Even back then, there was prediction addiction. And those messages were going through all over the church. But you want to add one thing. They, they were going through a time of persecution, a time of very heavy hardship. So it's easy for us to say, well, you know, everything is relatively okay. But it wasn't so easy for them to think that way. So Paul helped them to understand the truth. And that truth is just as important today as it was then. Because it's a truth that, like Jesus said, sets us free. Amen. I would like to read from Second Thessalonians, from chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as, it, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with, his breath, with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So that, that is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all the power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they, may, that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in weakness, wickedness. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning of sal for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Again, Paul keeps his tradition to, of packing a lot in that. But let's try to unpack it. Can I ask that that phone be turned off, please? Thank you. So let's look at it in detail. Verses 1 and 2. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Well, let's understand that. There were some people in Thessalonica who were spreading that rumor, who were talking about um, the trials that they were going through, the persecutions that they were enduring as if the day of the Lord had already come. And, well, obviously, because they were looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and, as Paul writes, our gathering together with them, they started thinking, wait a minute, if the day of the Lord has come and we are not gathered with them, that means that we missed out. And they were distressed. I mean, persecution was getting worse and worse. And they were disturbed by that. But Paul says, don't be quickly shaken. <coughs> shaken there in, in the Greek is tossed, agitated. Don't be quickly agitated. Don't be quickly shaken from your composure. Or be disturbed or continue a con indicating a continued state of tension and nervousness, don't be so distressed, either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So there were some messages, some talks, but also some letters, messages, uh, some Scholars think that, that when Paul says messages might, it, might indicate some sermons, some preaching, some sharing 
with some authority. And he said, don't let it be disturbed. The events that they were anticipating were not there. But God said, it's okay. It's okay. Don't let anyone tell you wrong things. Don't let anyone speculate on that. Don't let anyone drag you into that prediction addiction that I was mentioning about a little bit ago. Verses, uh, verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now why would they be concerned? I'm sorry, this is not verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians, but it is verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians. Earlier, the previous letter that Paul sent to the Thessalonians, he reassured them that God has not destined us for wrath. God has given us salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Titus, he wrote, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So, Paul was saying, there is hope. There is definitely hope, and you don't need to be disturbed by these words, these rumors that are going around about the day of the Lord. In other words, don't be afraid, because God has you covered. Verses 3 and 4. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And a man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. First of all, notice the good news. Let no one in any way deceive you. Let no one in any way deceive you. That is a clear warning. Deceiving about what? Well, in that particular case, of course, you could extend it and say, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. But in this particular case, it's referring to those who would say that our gathering together with them has been missed because the day of the Lord has come and you're still around and you're not gathered with him. Don't let anyone deceive you. And then Paul gives them a reason for that. And that reason is, look, that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And with that, he re is referring to the, the man of loss, lawlessness, also called in modern days as the Antichrist. Now, the man of lawlessness is going to be revealed well, that means that he is present, but not yet manifest. So at that time, something will come up, something will happen, and the man of lawlessness, or the Antichrist, will then be manifest. There will be a specific event in a specific time. The son of destruction, as is described in here. And... The man of lawlessness opposes everything that would be worshipped and exalts himself above all of that. Why? For what purpose? Well, because he wants to put himself up and call himself God. That's a very, very difficult thing to even fathom that somebody would do that. And I would have a hard time to believe it unless I actually saw somebody trying to do that. I've seen a couple of people in my 
years of ministry and even before. I've seen a couple of people claiming that they were God. And I can tell you, there's no way you could fall for that. But at that time, at that time, it's going to be difficult. God says it's going to be a hard time. It's going to be difficult. But it's going to be a specific event there. And Paul addresses it in just a moment. In fact, let's go and see, first of all, First Timothy, back into the first letter of Timothy. Um, that we saw some time back, verses, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, pray, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. So God warned us that things like that would happen. God warned us Indeed, that the time would come where there would be deceitful spirits allowed to deceive those who can be deceived. But let's look at verses 5 to 7. Do you remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Do you now remember, Paul says? In other words, Paul had already talked to them about that. Paul had given a warning about these things. And he wants them, the Thessalonians, and us to remember what he has said. And what are we to remember? Well, while he was still with the Thessalonians, he was telling them all these things. These things are things that should be known. Now, some people tell me, well, Luciano, don't, don't read those parts of the Bible because they sound mean, they sound hard, they sound harsh. Well, the Bible is not a menu. We cannot pick and choose what we want for the day. And that sometimes is the problem with as I was mentioning before, as I was encouraging you to do Bible study by actually taking the Bible and reading the Bible instead of reading something about the Bible. Because sometimes when people write about the Bible, they pick and choose what they write about. But you get the whole message from God. And you see that that message is balanced, it's still gracious, but sometimes because He loves you, He gives you a warning. Now, if I see my child, or my grandchild, maybe better yet at this time, going and walking toward the fire, would you say, well, let him be? Of course not. I would tell him, hey, no, that's wrong, that's bad, that's going to hurt you, that's going to be bad for you. I would give him a warning. And that's what God does with us. God tells us to be careful, because he loves us. God hates sin because he loves us. And he wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to say that God loves us unless God hates what destroys us. Sin destroys us. That's why God hates it, because he loves you. He hates what destroys you. You know what restrains him. Well, perhaps the Thessalonians did, because Paul apparently talked to them about it, but we don't. Because there's no reference throughout Scripture, and especially Paul doesn't tell us here um, who or how or what restrains him. But something does, and that's all that we need to know. And another said, if God wanted us to know that, he would have said, right there, right there, in that point, he would have said what it is. But he doesn't want us to, to know that. He has his own reasons. Don't ask me what they are because I have no clue. But he has his own reasons. And I learned over the years to trust him. He knows what, he knows when. So they knew what restrains him now, so that in that time he will be revealed. 
So there is a, a temporary restraint. There is a time for restraint, but there is a time in which all that evil, all that mess is going to be surfacing, it's going to be revealed. For the mystery, mystery because, well, no one knows until it, that Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, is revealed. It's a mystery because we don't know what it looks like, what it is. It's a mystery because it's, there are some, so many things that are unknown, but the day that he, as in verse 4, will display himself as being God, it will be absolutely clear that that's the case. That there is a specific event. So it's a mystery until that specific event occurs, and then it will be plainly clear. But that's a mystery of lawlessness that is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until it's taken out of the way. So whatever is going on there, there will be a time in which that restraint is going to be removed, and the men of lawlessness will do will cause the mess that he's going to cause. But there is another warning here in verse 7. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now it was at work in the days of Paul. It's still at work today. Now of course it's not at that point and the restraint is still there. But the day will come when the restraint is removed. The day will come in which that lawlessness will be more than rampant. And it will cause havoc all around the world. But Paul here is telling the Thessalonians, don't be afraid because it's not time yet. It's not happening now. What you heard that, that all that stuff has already occurred is not true. Because other things need to happen before. In other words, it's not God's timing. And thank God that he is in charge of the timing and not us. Because we will make a mess. Well, let's continue. Verses 8 to 10. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the, the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now this is a promise, first of all. Then that lawless <coughs> one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. Wow. Who's in charge? God is. Who's still in charge? Even though it's a mess, who's still in charge? God is. It seems like the whole world is going weird. Who is still in charge? God is. And Paul says, don't let it disturb you because God is still in charge and the moment will come the time will come when God is going to get rid of that lawless one with the breath of his mouth now this God it, it doesn't say here he's going to fight him it doesn't say here that he's going to be a battle or anything like that. it's just you know whew, gone Amen. who's in charge God, God is And bring to an end the, by, by the appearance of his coming. When the Lord returns, when the Lord is coming, all of that is gone. Then he, he confirms that what we're talking about is someone that is empowered by Satan, the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist. And he's empowered by, by Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. Now here's why the world will fall for that. The world will fall for it because sometimes we look for power. We look for signs. We look for wonders, for things like that. You know, hey, 
that, that, that preacher, he saved so many people. That preacher, he healed so many people. And I tell you over and over and over, no. No. No one saves anyone by Christ. No one heals anyone by God. So let's not take credit. Because a day will come in which there will be a great deal of power, a great deal of signs, and a great deal of false wonders to deceive the people, to make them think that this person is doing all these things. So now you know why I insist. One of the many reasons why I insist on that. No. Sometimes people come to me and say, thank you for this and thank you for that. And I say, but please, thank God. Not me. If it is from me, chances are it's wrong. But it is from God then you can stand secure. So thank him. Verse 10, And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth. It's interesting. Did you notice that warning there? Not receiving the love of the truth. Love, we define it so many times. It's probably coming out of your ears. Love is a giving of oneself for the benefit of others in Christ. And they did not receive the love of the truth. They did not receive that spirit that comes from God of the truth. So as to be saved. Going on, verses 11 and 12. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe in the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. <coughs> so part of this is a warning from God. He said, don't, don't, don't let new ideas, don't let the worldly concepts and thoughts deceive you because what God is saying is the truth and anything apart from that is not. So God is going to send a deluding influence or it could be translated literally as an activity of error. An activity of error. Think about that. It has two elements. The error, the and, and the error that is active in some way, in some form. A deluding influence. So that they will end up believing what is false. So why do we insist in sharing what is truth? Because anything but the truth will deceive you. Of course. But the point is that they would be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. It could be also be translated, I proved that wickedness. So they take pleasure in it, they approve it, they go for it, they support it. And yeah, yeah, if you say, well, we, we see in this today, we see in this because I, I don't know if there are many reasons why I don't go into Facebook, by the way. But one of them is I am ty tired of people griping. I am tired of people offending and hurting each other, calling each other names and putting each other down. I, I see that plenty enough elsewhere. I don't need to go and spend my time reading about that in there. But there is, there is this this thing about taking pleasure in wickedness. One day, my wife re remembers that in uh, Pasadena in California, just nearby our home. We, we went out of a house and we walked down the street. I think we were going to a store and, and there was a commotion of people. And I thought, what's going on? I mean, why are all these people gathered in here? And as I was thinking that, I saw an individual going in, in the house, which was right next to him nearby, pick up a chair and brought it outside to sit down and watch. Watch what? 
In front of them there was a high-rise building and an elderly man hanging outside the balcony wanting to jump to kill himself. And these people were sitting there watching them as if it was a show. And I was, I was, I was flabbergasted already by that. I heard one saying, man, this is better than a movie. I hope he jumps. And I'm thinking, where are we coming to? And I'm, I'm, I, I look at the shows that people enjoy. I look at the junk they put in their hearts and minds through the media and other things. It seems like everything that is evil is good. And everything that is good is evil. I've heard producers and actors in Hollywood that don't have work because they refuse to take roles that promote violence and promote blasphemy and promote things like that. And they said, no, I don't want to party. And they said, yeah, you, you don't work for us. But the media is not the only thing. We're doing it to ourselves. Video games. Look, I have nothing against some video games, but I have a lot against other video games. And I'll tell you why. Because many people, including Colonel Grossman, who was testifying in front of a, a Senate committee warned the people years ago, warned the people that if they were continuing to be trained in violence, they would one day see shootings in schools. Now what happened? Years later, it happened. They knew. And you know what he said in, the, in front of the committee of the a, of a Senate? He said, the, the games that you are feeding the children, we develop them to train our special forces and to train our SWAT teams to have less resistance in pulling the trigger when a person is in front of them. Because we noticed that they were hesitating in that moment. And because of that, dozens of other people were killed. So we had to find a way to train these people to have less resistance and we developed that software that now certain brands of video games were making commercial. He said, you are training, and I have several books if you want to see them, I'll show you from him. You are training your children to become killers. Now when he wrote that the first time, those school shootings weren't happening yet, but they are. See that taking pleasure in wickedness, finding it fun, approving it, is what is going on. But I'm thinking, if it is so disturbing now, what is it going to be like at that time? And I pray, Lord, may your kingdom come. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we need it desperately. And we're going to need it even more. But I think that Paul feels like you and me right now. Heavy. Because then in the next verse it says, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And I say, praise God. Yeah. We should give thanks to God. We should give thanks to God because He has chosen us. And he chose us from the beginning for salvation. Through what? Sanctification by the Spirit and the faith in the truth. Trust God's word. Trust God. 
So, brethren, what God is telling us here is we're okay. And we're going to be okay. Elsewhere in Revelation, I want to remind you that it, it, in the worst time in all of human history, the worst time ever in all past and future and present, the worst time of all history, there will be a great and innumerable multitude of people coming to Christ. So Paul here says, don't let all these things disturb you. Give thanks to God. For he has chosen you. He has called you. He has blessed you. Through sanctification by the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit working in us, transforming us, changing us, making us different from the way we used to be. Come on, let's face it. Who among us did not end up watching a violent movie and rooting for one of the people that were killing the others? Yeah, well, maybe we choose not to do that now. But there was a time in which I was sitting in front of a TV and said, yeah, yeah, go, go. Go get him. Until I realized, wait a second, what am I doing? What am I really doing? What am I training my mind to think like? Brethren, don't let anything shake or alarm you about the things coming. They need to come and they will be horrible. Yes, but don't be alarmed. Think of the coming of the Lord rather than concentrating on the judgment. Because if you're in Christ, then you are secure in him. Believers are saved. They're not condemned. They're saved because we're safe in Christ. Amen. But if we reject Christ, that safety is gone. If we reject Christ, there is nothing, nothing that can help us. Now, it takes a lot to actually and utterly reject Christ. But Scripture tells us that some people, unfortunately, will. God has chosen believers by the work of the Spirit and by faith. And is doing a work in them, in you, and through you. And that is what is important. Instead of like, like Paul invited the Thessalonians, instead of worrying about the things that are to come or the things that we would worry about, let's praise God for the role that he's give us, given us. And let's use the time that we have available to honor him, to praise him, to bring glory to him. That's our calling. Because after all, if we are here just for this life, then we are bound to be disappointed because this life is very, very short. But if we are here for him, if we are here for his work, then we're going to be thrilled because his work is going to continue no matter what. Because the Lord himself promised that even the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. You can throw anything at us. <coughs> anything at all. But the Lord on his word says nothing will prevail against the church, the body of Christ. Yours is a victory in Christ. Think about that. And thank God for it. God bless you. My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. 
If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, for you are my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. Your work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful sin. Seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grief has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise
O oh God, who have so wonderfully created us and even more wonderfully restored us, grants that we may participate in the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>